is to teach us to get over our selfishness so that we are good to other people. That's the, that's the only real reason for these things, and they're powerful reasons. But it's to get over the selfishness that each of us has that is biologically wired into us as tremendous threat everywhere. And science is now showing how meditation lowers the activation of the part of us that is threatened by other people. But this, this need to get along with others and to respect others and to treat them well, that's, that's the point. You know, I remember listening to um, Father Boyle, who is the Jesuit in Los Angeles who decided to try to do something to stop the gangs in LA from killing each other. And um, he was a minister in South Central LA, which is, you know, a terrible neighborhood. And he talked about having been a minister for like 20 years. I went to hear him once speak, and it was one of the most powerful experiences of me listening to somebody. And he's a Jesuit, you know, that I'm not. I'm just, it had nothing to do with the particular faith. But he talked about being in his church and knowing that there was violence all around and not doing anything about it. But he just, you know, his people came in, he gave his sermons, they left, and he was, he had a church. But he kept on thinking, I got it. Like, what am I doing here? Like, you know, these, these people are killing each other. And so one day, it, it becomes a powerful, like, thing to him. Like, he's saying to himself, well, I signed up to do God's work. It, it, I can't be afraid to go out into God's community, which seemed very sane to me. But I'm, I'm just, but then he says, I got to do something. So he goes out. And he goes between like these warring tribes wearing his clerical collar and the vestments. And there, the, the, God bless that the people who are like this, they won't shoot a priest. I mean, they won't. And so he says, stop and let's talk. So he brings people in from both of these factions and they talk. And then he helps set up an industry where they work together. And then he sets up all sorts of stuff where they can talk and communicate. And I did it again. <coughs> it's the only thing that'll shut me up, actually. <laughs> um, oh, I think this is dying. Oh, okay. Anyway, you can hear me without this. Um, but the thing that he said, and I'm, I'm, I'm as much or more a secular person as I am a religious person, but this is what he said that was so profound to me, listening. And, and this connects the religious and the secular. He said that if I'm a priest, which he obviously was, and I believe in this stuff, then he said, this is obviously God's earth. And my job is to help God take care of his earth. And that means I have to take care of people. And, and that struck me so forcefully. Because, again, our basic biological programming is personal fear and selfishness. Just take care of me and a handful of people I care for, and we have very primitive brains that are wired to do that at almost all costs. Then you get cultures that connect with each other to do the same thing, that we only serve our culture, we only take care of our people, we only honor us, which is just selfishness made bigger. But I can't, for me, that, that's never been enough. 
And so when I come to places where you have things like that, that you know, love is God and God is love, it, it, it boils down to, to me, that part of our biology and evolution is to grow into the kind of people who are kind, not just thinking of themselves, not just thinking of their own tribe, not just thinking of their own, the people who share their beliefs, but reaching beyond that. Otherwise, I don't see any reason necessarily for religion or spiritual practice. We can be selfish and self-absorbed without it. <laughs> We're good at that. But, but these, these places are the reminders to, if not to put others first, at least to put them somewhere in the mix, which is a reasonable bar. And, and the more research that comes out, which shows that it's really those of us who like other people, who get along with them, that are happy. That it's, it's not the wealth, and it's not the glory, it's people. And, and, you know, there's something so nice and simple about that. You know, so nice and simple. The last thing I'm going to say is what's, what's interesting now um, in terms of what makes marriage and long-term partnership successful is, again, so at variance with where our culture is. It's, it's almost ludicrous. But, you know, most of the books on how to get along with somebody, like looking for a partner. They're all about what can I get? It's like, how do I get what I want? How do I communicate so I get what I want? How do I find the right partner for me so I can advertise for who I want? It's almost like you're car shopping. <laughs> well, again, we have monetized everything. But it's so funny that the reality is what makes relationships successful, and, and, and this is where they have come even with data, is some amalgam of generosity, kindness, and appreciation basically all things you give, not just get. And that's fascinating, because in, 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 from what that says to me is like the, the drama is like how do we get past that very basic core of fear-based selfishness, I'm not saying anything new, and become more willing to give. And, you know, in a culture that values so much individual glory and what the individual wants, that doesn't set one up for good relationship. And if it's relationship that makes us happy, it doesn't set one up to be happy enough. And I think we all see that in current day America. It's not necessarily a happy place. And, and, and it would be interesting to know that one of the simplest antidotes is in whatever little sphere we have, is just to be a little bit nicer to each other. Just, I mean, when I talk to couples, it's like, it's not that complicated. Just shut up when you want to say something nasty. <laughs> open your mouth wide when you want to say something nice. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. <laughs>